welcome you're watching India Sense. I'm Gauri Dwedi. Let's get you the headlines this Friday evening. First up, uh, as China woos Jamaat e Islami, Chinese envoy becomes the first envoy in the last 14 years to visit Jamaat e Islami offices. An American delegation set to visit Bangladesh soon. The situation on India's eastern border remains a concern. Dhaka's precarious economic situation adding to New Delhi's concerns. Prime Minister Modi wraps up his four-day two-nation tour of Brunei and Singapore as India presses the pedal on its Act East policy. The visit comes amidst renewed efforts by New Delhi to increase engagement with ASEAN countries to secure its maritime interests. In a big affirmation to the Indian economy and its growth outlook, World Bank upgrades India GDP growth to 7%. Morgan Stanley increases India's weightage in its Emerging Markets Index potentially opening floodgates to massive global funding flows. Chinese President Xi Jinping announces $51 billion of investments at the, in Africa at the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation. Of this, only $10 billion is actual investment by Chinese companies. Remaining consists of loans. Forum saw several African nations seeking debt relief from China due to their high debt burden. And U.S. elections enter their decisive phase as the first postal ballot set to begin in North Carolina. All eyes on the first presidential debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump scheduled for the 10th of September. On to our big story this evening, which is Bangladesh as it enters a new chapter, settling into a new normal after decades of Sheikh Hasina's rule. String of developments are now threatening to impact India's security concerns on its eastern border. China is weighing in and so is America. Radical Islamists have been released even as Beijing is now trying to mainstream Jamaat-e-Islami with its envoy holding a meeting with the extremist organization, which is a first for a diplomat after 14 years. Add to it the race to fix the economy that's been ravaged by recent political instability, where both America and China are keen to play a major role in the hope that they remain relevant in a post yunus government as and when that happens. Now, take a look at this report to know about the extent of the flux that's taking place in the world's eighth most populous country. And then we come back and ask the question that is Bangladesh simply developing a new sovereign ident identity away from Hasina or is it shaping into a major security challenge at India's eastern border? Weeks after violent protests ousted former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina from power, Bangladesh is being governed by Mohammed Yunus. A Bangladeshi Nobel laureate serving as the chief advisor of the interim government since 8th August. While Yunus's appointment was hailed as the return of the people's will to Bangladeshi governance, social instability continues to remain a challenge stemming from recent developments since Yunus took power three weeks ago. The release of jailed extremists from Bangladeshi prisons is a cause for alarm. The Yunus-led government has ended the detention of radical Islamist leaders under the alleged influence of the Jamaat-e-Islami group, an outfit outlawed during the Hasina era. The release of Jashimuddin Rahmani, head of the Ansarullah Bangla team, an Islamic organization implicated in the brutal murders of atheist bloggers between 2013 and 2015, has sparked concerns about judicial integrity under the new administration. The government's alleged ties to Jamaat-e-Islami have sparked debates over its commitment to progressive principles. Meanwhile, it is expected that these groups will contest elections as and when they happen. Add to this the possibility of border police responding to a large number of people crossing the porous but deadly Indo-Bangladeshi border. Deep societal divisions between supporters of the former Hasina government and present dispensation have deeply altered the social fabric of Bangladesh. Compounding this are Dhaka's economic woes. 
its $55 billion garment industry has been severely impacted, with 60 factories outside Dhaka set to be closed and three big brands, including Disney and Walmart, looking at other geographies for next season's clothing. Okay, that tells you the context and the scale of what's happening in Bangladesh. And to ensure the situation remains under control, India needs to be mindful of three important things. First, the UNIS government, which lacks constitutional legitimacy, may not be the final arbitrator in Bangladesh. The military has been emboldened. It's heavily invested in preserving the status quo. In fact, it was the military chief who had announced Hasina's resignation, indicating his elevated status in the country's present decision-making apparatus. The second, India should keep the pressure on UNIS's interim government to hold an election and return to a democratic framework. As of now, there's no visibility on when that could happen. And the third important thing, it's easy to draw parallels with the Pakistani situation. There's a strong military, crackdown on opposition, attacks on minority Hindu community, but the distinction is the economy. As of now, Bangladesh has sought a $6.5 billion bailout due to its falling forex reserves, but India must help ensure that the Bangladeshi economy's health does not deteriorate further or else it could go down a path that is similar to Islamabad. Shifting focus now to the first viral angle story of uh, the broadcast. Uh, just two weeks after Prime Minister Modi met Ukrainian President Zelensky and less than two months after his visit to Moscow, New Delhi may play a pivotal role in ending the conflict which has been continuing since February 2020. Before we come back and talk more about how that could happen, first listen in to Russian President Putin talking about India's major role in such a scenario. First of all, it is the Chinese People's Republic, Brazil, India. I maintain continuous, I'm in contact with uh, my partners and I have no doubt that uh, the leaders of these uh, countries and we have uh, the relations of uh, trust and confidence with one another will be really interested and provide a helping hand. If there is uh, a desire of the Ukraine uh, to carry on with the negotiations, I can do that. But there are many conditions and demands from both Russia and Ukraine, whether it's top troop withdrawals, whether it's recognizing territories, it's removal of West-imposed sanctions for Russia. There's a plethora of issues and arriving at a common ground could be painstakingly long. But the precursor to that is the starting of the very process that requires both parties to be at the negotiating table. Remember the peace summit that took place in Switzerland in June 2024 failed because there were 92 countries that were present, but Russia was absent. But with India's backing, the peace process can now start, since New Delhi has strategic stakes on both sides. The West has feared India's sympathy with Russia will erode the efficacy of its sanctions, while Russia has urged India to maintain its independent stance. India is no more a bystander in this conflict. Prime Minister Modi, after his homily to Putin, and said that today is not an era of war, is in a position to talk peace to the Russian side. And it was his message of dialogue and diplomacy to Kiev that carried weight. Remember, twice foreign ministers of Russia and Ukraine have met in Istanbul to thrash out a possible peace deal. So it's not that mediators are not around. It's about the opportune time and the right fitment, and which it seems is now with New Delhi at its very center. All right, we've come to the top voice segment of the show. Prime Minister Modi wrapped up his two-nation tour of Singapore and Brunei, picking up from the momentum in his first uh, term. Let's get in the first top voice on the show, Professor Kanti Bajpai, who's the Bilmer Professor of Asian Studies at the National Institute of Singapore, to not talk more about the impact of India's active policy and India's role as far as the South China Sea is concerned. Professor Bajpai, I appreciate you speaking to me on India Sense. Uh, I want to ask you a first question, which is the evolution of India's Act East policy. How do you see that transforming since the early days of Look East? Well, I think um, it's uh, interesting that these four countries, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, Brunei, and now Singapore, have been at the forefront of what Mr. Modi has been doing in the last few days. Um, because really, in a sense, uh, over the last two or three years, uh, most of Mr. Modi's second term 
Southeast Asia didn't feature very high. Uh, in his first term, he was here a lot. Uh, and I think he came to Singapore at least twice, if not three times in his first term. He uh, went to other countries in the region. But in the second term, it's been very noticeable that Southeast Asia has not really been on his map or even any of the, uh, the other very senior ministers, although uh, Jai Shankar was here a couple of times as well. So I think this is uh, significant because uh, he himself uh, is at the forefront of these visits and handshakes. And it signals, uh, I think, a renewed interest uh, in New Delhi in uh, the uh, Act uh, East uh, policy. So I think that's welcome because, as I said, the last four or five years, India lost interest, I think, uh, in the region uh, to quite a perceptible extent. And I think the region lost interest in India as well. And do you see India being able to really counter uh, China, position itself as a counter to China in the South China Sea? Yeah, I mean, certainly the dragon in the room in all these meetings uh, is China. So none of India's interlocutors here, nor India itself, will put the China factor up front because it's very uncomfortable, both for New Delhi and for these countries. But clearly, I mean, that's the larger strategic backdrop uh, to the Act uh, East policy, and before that, the Look East policy. So uh, I think Malaysia probably is the friendliest to China of, of these countries. Uh, and um, Singapore, of course, is very well positioned with China. Uh, perhaps uh, the greatest tensions in the maritime space have been with Vietnam because they, uh, uh, they have a claim, the Chinese, over the South China Sea, which impacts Vietnam. It also impacts Malaysia, but Malaysia has been uh, willing to swallow hard and I think not uh, antagonize the Chinese too much. But yeah, I mean, even the Malaysians, Kuala Lumpur has its own concerns about the South China Sea. Um, so yeah, I would say you're right that the larger backdrop, of course, you know, you can sign any number of MOUs. Uh, uh, Mr. Modi just signed four with Singapore, but MOUs are usually fizzle out. And we all know as we're part of organizations that most MOUs are not even actionable very much. But the larger picture, strategic picture, is, of course, uh, the military geopolitical domain. And while nobody wants to utter the word China, that's what the big backdrop uh, inevitably is, particularly, I would say, in Singapore and Vietnam. I know MOUs, you, you mentioned any number of them could be signed. But what about trade? It's the fulcrum of any bilateral partnership. Do you think that bit India is getting right in terms of India and ASEAN as a whole? Well, if you mean by connectivity, you mean India actually helping build infrastructure such as uh, highways and railways and, and ports and so on in this region, then India's record is not great. Uh, take Myanmar, for instance, even before the virtual civil war there, which makes it impossible now to do very much, even before that, for 20 years, India had been unable to finish uh, various projects there and to connect, connect up uh, through Myanmar to the Asian highway. So. You know, I think clearly, uh, leaving Myanmar aside, if on the mainland Southeast Asia, we can uh, take some things to completion, then that would be quite impressive. Uh, the region has got big players here. So uh, India must be prepared for some quite modest gains. Uh, uh, before China and its BRI, the Japanese for 40 years, 50 years were the, you know, the kings of uh, infrastructure development and connectivity. Um, so India can only play a smaller role, perhaps as it signaled a few years ago with Japan. Um, but um, again, I think the accent is really on delivering some successes. Uh, do something where you can actually deliver in the short to medium term to bring back some sense that India delivers on promises and can make a difference. So that means being selective uh, and uh, pulling together your own domestic agencies and interagency uh, kind of coordination to actually deliver in real time. I think over a number of things, and not just connectivity, there's been disappointment in the region about India's ability to uh, deliver. I mentioned the RCEP, but you know, uh, food exports, uh, promising something one day and then suddenly finding food shortages in India a week, two weeks later, and then saying we were embargoing wheat and uh, rice exports, promising uh, to deliver vaccines and then not quite being able to because there was a surge in India. You know, I mean, people understand that, but at the same time, then there are questions about reliability, you see. So I think uh, pick selectively, deliver on something 
even in the connectivity domain, um, to make a real difference. Indeed. Indeed, trade connectivity could really be the hallmark of this engagement going forward. Appreciate uh, Professor Bajpai for speaking to me on India Sense. And on that note, we slip into a very short break. We come back on the other side with the latest as far as the Indian economy is concerned. A major upgrade. What does it mean? We come back and talk more on that. Welcome back. You're watching uh, India Essence with me, Gauri Divedi. Now, the second wide angle story on the show, which is uh, about Indian economy and in recognition of the rising heft and the massive growth opportunity that the Indian economy now has, the uh, World Bank has upgraded the growth outlook for the current financial year for India to 7% uh, at a time when the Chinese economy seems to be struggling to meet its growth forecast. Uh, in addition to that, there's been an increase in India's weightage by Morgan Stanley in its emerging markets in Index, which sets the stage for India's rapid rise to a seven trillion or possibly a ten trillion dollar economy in the next five to eight years. Take a look at this report that breaks these trends down in greater detail. Weeks after the IMF upgraded the forecast of the Indian economy to seven percent, the World Bank has followed suit. And in line with global growth expectations, Morgan Stanley's latest report gives India the largest weighting in the Emerging Markets Investable Index, effectively overtaking China. The data shows a better-than-expected outlook for the world's fastest-growing economy. The bright economic outlook, coupled with higher weightage on the index, is set to translate into more global flows into India, allowing fears that the Indian equity markets may be primed for a correction. In fact, FBIs bought shares worth 6.33 billion US dollars in 2024 on the backs of earnings growth for Indian companies, which is higher than other emerging markets by 60%. Indian equity markets are also a lucrative investment destination due to the higher return on equity, a matrix where China has halved since 2014. The World Bank upgrade has come on the back of higher public investments and a surge in household investment in the real estate sector. Meanwhile, the World Bank says India remained the fastest growing major economy and grew at a rapid clip of 8.2% in the 2023-24 financial year. The upgrade, from the earlier projection of 6.6%, comes at a time when the Chinese economy is struggling and facing headwinds mostly due to its real estate sector and its cascading impact on the Chinese banking system. The housing crisis, which has been ongoing for nearly four years, has now impacted household earnings and the financial sector. Adding to the worries over the health of the Chinese economy is a lower-than-expected services growth. The IMF has termed services as an underutilized growth driver for China, contributing far less than its potential. Sparking fears of a larger risk is China's factory activity, which contracted for a fourth straight month in August. The contraction indicates the world's largest economy may struggle to meet its growth target of around 5%. For New Delhi, its task is cut out. It needs to prioritize getting big-ticket investment and press the pedal on its $1 trillion manufacturing goal, which requires favorable trade pacts. As the global trade landscape gets more protectionist, India's trade policy holds the key to its growth trajectory. All right, second top voice on the show, Raymond Vickery, who's the former uh, Secretary of uh, Trade and Commerce Development, speaks to me at a time when... Uh, there is the first presidential debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump and postal ballots begin today. Take a look at this exclusive conversation. We have with us Mr. Raymond Vickery, former U.S. Secretary of Commerce and Trade Development, speaking exclusively to NDTV. So thank you so much for taking out the time and speaking to NDTV World. Thank you for and, having uh, me. My first question, sir, we speak at a time when uh, the U.S. elections have uh, moved to the next decisive uh, phase. There's just about two months to go. Um, before we get into the specifics about the India-U.S. relationship and how India views it right now and the election also and the candidates, how do you see the election right now as it is poised just about two months to go? 
Well, uh, it is a completely changed and different situation. Uh, President Joe Biden stepping back, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris stepping up has changed the equation uh, entirely. I think uh, that the president uh, had done a great job bringing the economy in for a soft landing, uh, getting infrastructure going and so forth, but the reality was that that first debate indicated uh, that the president uh, did have difficulties particularly engaging. Uh, that uh, has been wiped away. Uh, Kamala Harris uh, did a great job uh, at the convention. Uh, her first interview uh, with uh, CNN was uh, very good. And people think now that uh, the uh, debate, which is coming up next Tuesday, uh, she'll be able to uh, hold her own against Donald Trump. And it is those kinds of perceptions which have energized the base of the Democratic Party, uh, particularly women, women of color, young people, people who are interested in some changes in foreign policy, particularly in regard to Gaza. So right now we have a, a neck and neck race, but if you look at uh, polls, and polls are not always accurate, but what they do show is trends. And whether you look at national polls, you look at battleground polls, the, what you see in terms of a trend is the different situation I indicated, which is moving in favor of Vice President Harris. I know you're a Democrat uh, and you know you, you speak from that position, but uh, how do you see now the Democrat camp being uh, energized after uh, Kamala Harris coming in, after a uh, record amount of uh, funding she's able to uh, generate and raise? And most importantly, what's the kind of strategy that uh, Democrats have now in these last uh, seven, eight weeks? Well, it all comes down to turning out the vote, uh, what we call Go TV, uh, get out the vote uh, in the United States. And you have to have the cadres at the local level who will do uh, the knocking on doors, uh, the making of calls, the giving of uh, uh, rides uh, to uh, the polls. Those Is that system now been completely re-energized with Kamala oh, yes, Harris? Oh, yes, it has been. We've got people coming into uh, headquarters all across the United States uh, looking for yard signs, wanting to know how uh, they can help. Whereas uh, before, uh, people were saying, yeah, I will vote for the president, but uh, you know, maybe I've got something else that I need to do between now uh, and uh, November the 5th. And that's a, that's a completely, uh, completely different situation. Now, we have a lot of undecided uh, voters uh, in the United States as well. I think that's a reflection of the fact that Kamala Harris is not known well uh, nationally. So while people might have had their minds pretty well made up when the known qualities of uh, President Biden and Donald Trump were there, uh, now you have somebody, somebody new and people are saying, well, I, I'm, I'm undecided. I want to take a look. And that's been estimated as as much as uh, 15 to 20 percent of the voters, which is a huge number. Just uh, two months before the election. Two months before the election. Uh, in my view, uh, that uh, requires... Uh, the kind of energy we're talking about, because those undecided people are not going to decide just on who does better on that debate on Tuesday. They're going to say, what are their friends and neighbors uh, telling them about the candidates? And or some would say, what is the candidate themselves putting out in terms of agenda? Is that an area that you feel that as a Democrat, uh, maybe more needs to be done in terms of crystal clear agenda well, that what Harris, no, Harris stands for? There's no question that we have to put meat on the bones. The whole campaign of Vice President Harris has to be premised on looking forward. Uh, and that premise requires two things. It requires the kind of hope uh, and, and uh, enthusiasm, uh, optimism about the future, but it also requires some knowledge of what that future is likely to look like. Uh, and as the campaign has gone on, there has been uh, more meat put on the bones. 
it's no surprise that uh, we haven't had the kind of detail on websites uh, and in other places about uh, the platform because of the change personnel involved. But if you look at the economic uh, proposals, uh, they are populist in nature, uh, $6,000 credit for newborn uh, children getting uh, the child tax credit back to where it was during the pandemic, uh, a provision on housing uh, to be able to give a $25,000 grant for the first time, capping health care uh, costs, uh, drug costs particularly. So as we go along, there is a, going to be more meat, but there has to be that. Uh, for example, I would say, uh, let's take the, the question about uh, fracking, um, in, on which the vice president has changed her stance, uh, uh, yeah. her stance on that. Mm. You have to not only say to people, I've changed my stance, you have to say why. And I expect to hear uh, more, more, of about, that. more about that as to why it fits into an agenda on uh, fighting climate change and helping the environment. Mr. Vickery, thank you so much for taking thank out the time and speaking me. to... It's NBC. always a pleasure to be with NDTV. Completely timed out on this edition of India Sense. Thanks so much for watching.